evening uh, this evening. Um, last week, um, well, let's first open up with a word of prayer. If we could just uh, bow our heads and uh, and, I, and I'll pray for us here. Heavenly Father, just thank you for another beautiful day that you've given us and your creation, Lord. And I just think, thank you for those who have come tonight, Lord. I pray that you you'll be glorified in whatever is said and whatever words that, that are spoken, Lord. Lord, I just thank you for Jerry who has the insight on how to operate the equipment so that we could go, uh, go through this smoothly. Um, and Lord, uh, we just thank you for everything you've done for us in our lives. Even today, the blessings that we're not even aware of, dear Lord, that you've given us throughout our lives, we give you all the credit. And thank you, Lord, in your precious name. Amen. Uh, tonight's going to be on, uh, I'm going to try and cover two of the feasts. Uh, remember, there are four fe uh, spring, uh, four feasts that are considered the spring early in the year. And then there are di additional feasts in the fall. Um, so we'll hopefully cover, begin with those next week. Uh, I do want to mention something, though, that um, I left you with last week. Um, and we was talking about the time, the time that Jesus Christ gave up the ghost on the cross, the ninth hour, which would be 3 o'clock uh, p.m. our time. We're six hours if you look at the way they... Um, way they do their, uh, you know, look at a 24-hour uh, system. Uh, it starts in the evening, rather midnight. But this is a point I want to make. And this was brought out in our first lesson, Between the Evenings. And the Between the Evenings was a time, some of your scriptures will say twilight, or dusk, or towards the evening, or evenings, plural. But here's my point. If you want to get a good visual, um, maybe picture of what that might look like, um, Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 4, it mentions that. It doesn't say between the evenings or evening, but it says we got to prepare for war. And I'm paraphrasing here. Prepare for war because the day is gone. They're at midday. That's noon. It specifically says that, and it says the shadows are stretching. So when they're talking about is the sun is beginning or at that moment that Jeremiah uh, witnessed that and wrote it down, the sun was beginning to decline. And so that's where we get between the evening. But read Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 4. Okay, so this week we're uh, going to start with the feast of unleavened bread. Um, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, uh, a couple things we need to know about Israel before we start. And Israel is a, a Gagarian culture. It's norm, uh, nomad, uh, nomadic. They're always on the move. They camp overnight. They stay a few days at the base of um, Mount Sinai, at least three days. They were there and longer. Uh, feasts are intimately linked to agricultural seasons driven by different phases of the moon. And that's what was so important about the first lesson. What drives these feasts? What is it about them, the feasts, that in the first month, known as Aviv, of their sacred calendar, what drives those? Well, it's the phases of the moon. It's not the equinox which is what we use today, and primarily uh, the Jewish or Judy, uh, the rabbis later on, way long after Jesus Christ started using the equinox. But here we are, chapter 12 in Exodus, and there's no such thing to them. They didn't have that kind of knowledge, or they might have that knowledge, but they didn't have the wherewithal to determine what the equinox were. So the spring equinox is, is when the sun is directly over the equator. And so you have 12 days of night and 12 days 
are 12 hours of night and 12 hours of day. Okay, so our journey begins with the month of Aviv to commemorate the day Israel was released from Egyptian slavery, from bondage. Aviv means green, young barley ears. And you can see the scripture references where I, where I pulled this out of. And it should be the beginning of months, the first month of the year. Months of the Hebrew calendar always begin at first sight of the first sliver of the new moon. Now we went over that as well. What does that mean? Okay, they would literally have somebody standing there looking for that sliver of new moon. And when they saw it, they would consider that the beginning, the beginning of a new month. So the time that, and this didn't change, uh, that, you know, it's always changing, just like we change, just like our culture changes. I mean, they went through the same changes, but at the time of Jesus Christ, they were still what? They still were looking at the new moon. The new moon, that means that Jesus Christ died on no, uh, Nicene the 14th. That would have been the full moon. Okay, so you can see how the different um, phases of the moon drives their calendars, even during the time of Jesus Christ. So um, annual feasts, uh, well, m months of the Hebrew calendar always began. I just said that at the first, at first sight of the first sliver of the new moon. All annual feasts are set by the first month of the sacred calendar, Aviv. That's what's so critical, understanding what that's all about. You know, it's a new calendar. It's a new system. All right? So they were called three times a year. God commanded them that three times a year thou shalt keep a feast unto me in the year. Three times a year. They were, um, these were seasons, again, driven by the moon. You had the wheat. You had the um, late in the year, for example. You had um, figs. You had, you know, uh, basically what grew on trees. So the fall is what it would be. So we're going to get into some of this as to what it is, but it's mentioned three to four different times here. God commanded. And at this time, they would bring uh, what's called a sheaf, uh, of first fruit, and we're going to look at that, and wave it before the Heavenly Father. That's part of the process. And this would be a time that they would bless. They would pray. They would thank the Heavenly Father as to the crop, as they're growing, what He has done for them. It wasn't about them per se, but it was about what God did for them and they would be this this process of going before the heavenly Father three times would be thanking Him uh, for what they've done for them in their lives. The crops, everything is around the growing seasons. Okay, so uh, this is the feast of unleavened bread. As I said, seven days shall there be no leaven found in your houses, for whosoever eateth that which is leaven, even that soul shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether it be a stranger or born in the land. It didn't matter who you were, if you were a stranger or if you were a Jew. That cut off means, and in many cases, put to death. Just, however, that applies to the scripture. Okay, so we have to, again, we have to go all the way back. How does this foreshadow Jesus Christ. We all have to go back again to chapter 12 of Exodus. And we find here that at midnight, at midnight, you might be familiar with that, the death angel passed over Egypt. That's where the word Passover comes from. So at midnight, and Moses, just prior to that, in the 12th chapter of Exodus, told, gathered the elders together and told them to strike what? The lintel and the doorposts with blood of the lamb. 
the lamb that was um, that was killed without a blemish, first year. I mean, we went through all of that. But this is taking that blood, but this is how they will be protected from the tenth plague that was going to be poured out on Egypt. So at midnight, but later on when it actually happened, when it actually happened, Pharaoh, he got, he got worried. He was scared to death. It was his first son that died. The first sign, uh, first son of all, uh, of everyone that did not follow through with the command of God is to put the blood on the uh, lintel and the doorpost. That included the firstborn of animals, of cattle, it says. So that's everything. Firstborn. And here's Pharaoh. You can tell by the scripture, he is really upset. He is, you know, he's scared to death. It's, and he, he, Pharaoh, called Moses and Aaron by night and said, Rise up and get ye forth from among my people, both ye and the children of Israel. Go serve the Lord as you have said. Now notice that's at midnight. So if we're thinking midnight here in our culture, a 24-hour day, that's when the day changes. The day's already changed. It changes at 6 p.m. So if the lamb was slaughtered and killed at 3 p.m. as Jesus Christ was on the cross, then we've already passed into the next day at midnight. That would have happened between the evenings. That would have happened at around 6, 6 p.m. So now it becomes a new day. We've gone from the 14th. We're now on the 15th day of Nicene. That's important when we get to the New Testament to know that day. Um, also take your flocks and your herds, as you have said, be gone and bless me also. And the Egyptians urged the people that they might send them out of the land in haste. For they said, we should all die. So it wasn't Pharaoh that was just scared to death, but it was also the people, knowing that they didn't follow through with putting the blood, marking the, um, the lintel and the doorpost as commanded, then they, you know, they were affected by the tenth plague, and that is your firstborn will die. Okay? And the... And the people took their dough before it was leavened and uh, leavened their kneeling troughs being bound up in their clothes and upon their shoulders. Remember, they were to be on the ready. They described it. They described it. They had their sandals on. Their loins were girded. They had their staff. They had everything. They're ready to go at a moment's notice. Okay, so that's what's going on here. Everything was packed up, ready to go. And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians so that they lent unto them such things as they required. And if you read that part of Scripture, it's personal belongings. It says spoiled. Some uh, translations would use borrowed. They might use other terms. But the point is they gave them things as they needed. They took them from the Egyptians. Okay? And then... The children of Israel journeyed from uh, Ramesses uh, to Sakoth, about 600,000 men on foot besides children, besides children and their wives, the entire family. So if you take a look at that, that's more than 600,000. And they traveled between these two places. When I looked on a map, and I, it, I, there's a range anywhere from 110 to 150 miles. But on a map I got most consistently was 120 miles. So they're on their way. And just remember, when they left, you know, uh, in the middle of the night, you might say, middle of the morning, between midnight and, and uh, daylight, um, they were released from bondage. When Pharaoh said, go, and go worship your God, take everything with you, they were released from bondage at that moment. At that moment. And it was on Nicene the 15th. Joshua, we hear about, uh, when did they actually keep the first Passover? Now remember, up to this point, 
and even beyond, it was they were always being commanded to do this, to do certain things, to have the Passover, to have the yeast of unleavened, the feast of uh, yeast of unleavened bread, to have the feast of weeks, to have you know, he was commanding them. But here, what is different is that Joshua, when they crossed the Jordan River, they had the first Passover. They on themselves took up on uh, to follow God's command. So, you know, it, it's everything through there. Even in uh, Numbers chapter 9, they had the uh, Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and so on. But it was God who commanded them through Moses to do so. This is the first time. It's very important. This is the first time they took upon themselves to obey God. Okay, if you'll... Um, and the children of Israel encamped in Gilgal... And kept the Passover on the 14th day. There's that number again. That day. It's a full moon. Okay. Of the month at even in the plains of Jericho. They did eat of the old corn to the land on the morrow. After the Passover. Unleavened cakes and parched corn in the selfsame day. And the manna ceased on the morrow. After they had eaten of the old corn of, of the land. Neither had the children of Israel manna anymore, but they did eat of the fruit of the land of Cana that year. Okay, so we move on here. There's a couple things. Um, um, a couple things I need to point out about the Feast of Unleavened Bread as we go through this. The Feast of Unleavened Bread, and I'm going to explain what a holy convocation or assembly is, but the Feast of Unleavened Bread is not called or connected to the seven-day Sabbath. There's nowhere in the Scripture that I could find where it's connected. It, it's called an ordinance in Exodus 12, uh, chapter 12, verse 17. And ye shall observe, uh, observe the Feast of Unleavened Bread. For in this selfsame day I have brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. There shall ye... Observe this day in your generation by an ordinance forever. Okay, and then you find in, even in Leviticus where they're laying down, the, they're writing down the law surrounding these feasts, concerning these feasts. Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them concerning the feast of the Lord, which ye shall proclaim to be holy convocations, even these are my feasts. Okay, and then if you look at uh, Deuteronomy chapter 16, 8, six days, ye shall eat unleavened bread on the seventh day, shall have a solemn assembly. Notice what it's being called in the scripture. To the Lord thy God, thou shalt do no work therein. And in several places, I won't go through them, but you can look them up. In several places, this is called a feast. It's not connected to the seven-day Sabbath. Okay? So then where do we go from? This is what the calendar might look like. And this is... Uh, I've kind of pared down because of the length of the scripture. But again, in Leviticus 23, uh, chapter or verses 6 through 8, and on the 15th day of this month, see the Passover is on the 14th. The 15th, the next day, begins the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Uh, the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and unto the Lord, seven days you must eat unleavened bread. On the first day ye shall have a holy convocation. Now, I'll explain exactly what that is. Ye shall do no several work therein. The seventh day is a holy convocation. So, um, and ye shall do no several work therein. Now, they're not to do any work, but that's... Um, but we're going to see that on the holy convocations, there's leniency. Matter of fact, in Exodus, I think it's chapter 12 or around verse 6, they can prepare food. They can do things for themselves where they're very strict 
when it comes to the seven-day Sabbath. Very strict. Uh, there was a gentleman, a uh, brother in Christ in Sunday school. I won't forget it. He had this long list. And, you know, we all kind of chuckled. But that's true. That's even true today. A long list of things. Down to the toilet paper. It's prepositioned. Now, I've had other people tell me that, so I can confirm what he was saying. It, to us, it sounds very silly, but to them, to do anything. That's why they got after Jesus in the field. Remember, they were looking for food on the Sabbath. You know, so that's all very important to them. And I'm sure you look back um, in the future at us today, there's, they're going to chuckle at, you know, at us. So... You know, things change. Cultures change. All right? So this is what the calendar would look like. This is what it should look like. You have the Passover meal. It's not a feast. They actually, in, in uh, Leviticus, or in uh, um, Exodus chapter 12, it's called a service. Okay? Then you have this feast of unleavened bread from the 15th to the 21st. Now, what are these holy convocations? Okay, uh, holy convocation, speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them concerning the feast of the Lord, which she, ye shall proclaim to, the holy, to be holy convocation, even these are my feasts. They're actually part of his feasts. They're commanded by the heavenly Father. Now what does all this mean? I'll tell you, look at this picture. Look how they're talking. This one gentleman here on the left has his hands raised up. Another one is getting water out of this big clay jar. You couldn't do that on a Sabbath. It was strict, a seven-day Sabbath. It was so strict. But here, you notice how they're just laissez-faire. They're just laying back. Well, there's a reason for that. There's a purpose. The, the holy convocation was different than the seven-day Sabbath, okay? So how was it different? And I'm not trying to make you, everybody, I, I'm not teaching you Hebrew, but I felt like that I had to, you know, uh, break down what a holy convocation was. A holy convocation, and the Strong's Concordance of uh, 4744, okay, is, I want you to key in on two words here, a reading and a rehearsal. That's what a holy convocation was. You can call it other things. There are some uh, translations uh, um, will call it a sacred assembly or just an assembly. If we call this a, a holy convocation or an assembly, we've missed the point. We've missed the purpose for what these days were for. These were certainly Sabbath days of rest. No denying that. But they were for a different purpose than the seven-day Sabbath that uh, uh, Israel is so famous for, okay? And we are too. We have carried that over into our courts, culture hundreds, thousands of years, over two millenniums anyway, all right? So if you look at this, it comes from a base word. Well, here, it's more accurately known as a proclamation, a recital, a reading, or a rehearsal. Okay, so they had work to do. Okay, again, it's not as strict as a seven-day Sabbath. And, and there's other things, too, that go along with that we'll look at. And in the first day, they shall be a, there sh shall be a holy convocation. And in the seventh day, there should be an, um, a holy convocation to you. No manner of work shall be done in them, save that every man must eat. The that only may be done for you. In other words, you couldn't have a potluck dinner. That's not what it's for. We, call, we have an assembly and we all bring, we bring our favorite covered dish and we, and we, and we you know, we uh, visit, we fellowship. That's not what this is for. So it's, it's not just an assembly. Okay, so if a holy, a holy convocation or assembly it's a Hebrew word from the Hebrew text. It's a proclamation. It's a recital, a reading, or a rehearsal. It's based on Quora, which is a word that you're familiar with. And I have an example 
uh, of that is to call out or to call, recite. You get the drift here of what we're talking about here. They had work to do here. And what are they calling out? What are they reciting? They are reciting the Tanakh. That is the Hebrew Bible. It has, uh, it's divided into three parts. It has the law, it has the prophets, and it has the writings. And they would repeat, literally repeat. Look down here at the bottom of the, the, bottom of the screen here. Uh, Nehemiah kind of puts it in context. So they read in the book in the law of God distinctly and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. That's what this time was for. It was reading as a reminder what happened in Egypt. What happened when God brought us out of Egypt? So it's those things that occurred in the past. They're repeating those. But they're also looking forward into the future and to what things are to come. Okay, so they weren't setting there just, you know, uh, memories. It was about that. But it was also profoundly looked at as looking forward as those prophecies or those things that God has in store for us written in the scriptures. They would read them out loud. They would do that over and over. That's why it's called a recital and a rehearsal. You know, if you look at uh, Genesis chapter 1 as an example of where this comes from, God called out. He called out the light. Or he called the light day. He called the darkness. The darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. He called out. You get, you get the importance of this or, or the understanding of what this holy convocation is. It's a day of rest. That's, that's a fact. But that day of rest required them to recite, to read, to proclaim the glory of God. It reminds me of that 12-month reading of the Scripture. You know, that we set time aside to do that. It's, this is public. This is public and it's done at the synagogue. It would be done in this room on a Sunday morning or a Sunday evening, reading out loud and discussing, understanding what the, heaven, the words, inspired words that the Heavenly Father has given us. But Nehemiah really, really puts the point on it. Yes? I would think they were in one huge assembly. The small groups came later. The, the, uh, the house churches that I think of when I talk about, or when I think, the, the, the question was, was it a small group or was it one big group? Okay, and my response to that question is that at this point in time, it's just like the picture says. It's just like... Um, it's just like this. Um, the, the closest I can get to this, it's in our scripture. The closest I can get. And, and, and I know this New Testament, so I'm not trying to conflate or confuse you. But in the New Testament, Jesus Christ in Luke 4, chapter 4, around verse 18, he started his ministry. And what did he do? What did Jesus Christ of Nazareth do? He walks into the synagogue. They hand him a scroll. He opens it up and he reads from it. And he reads from Isaiah when he's doing that. Now that's the closest I can come to explaining what this is all about. But remember, what were they doing? They were reciting to one another out loud. Those things that already occurred in this case, pretty big, that coming up out of Egypt, being released from Egypt, and then looking forward to what was come. Uh, come. That, that's a good question, though. It really is, because in the, when we get to the New Testament, they had house churches, so you had small groups. It was different. 
but there was another feast at work too. Hmm. That's pretty cool. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I'm just trying to explain to you what is a holy convocation. So I have this on here, and you can go back to it and, and, and um, you know, kind of review it again after class or sometime this week. But just remember the holy convocation. And, and this is some other way that they, here we have it again. Um, it says, and, and look, and he said, I will make my goodness uh, pass before thee. I will proclaim, I will call out, I will make known the name of the Lord before thee and will be gracious to them, I will be gracious and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. Proclaim. Okay, this is why it's different. In many ways is it different. First of all, the Sabbath. I'm talking about the seven-day Sabbath. Okay, theirs were Saturday. Ours is Sunday. Nonetheless, seven-day Sabbath. It can be traced back to creation. The seven-day Sabbath can be traced back to creation. Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 and 3. 25, and you didn't hear in your scripture, you wouldn't hear any more about a Sabbath. About 2,500 years later, the Heavenly Father, after the release from uh, Pharaoh and his bondage in Egypt, we witness the seventh day of rest evolving into something even more substantial. It was a sign, a perpetual covenant between God and Israel, a perpetual forever as we understand perpetual it's included as the fourth commandment it's the only commandment he sanctified and made holy the fourth commandment is the only commandment not mentioned in the new testament all the others are in some form or another jesus becomes Jesus is our Sabbath rest in part because he is the Lord of the Sabbath. Jesus Christ is our Sabbath. Jesus, or take, and this is my favorite verse, Matthew chapter 11, uh, starting with verse 8. Actually, it goes beyond that. Uh, but take my yoke upon you and learn of me. There's a condition there. Learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. In contrast, there remains a Sabbath rest for the God, for the people of God, for all people of God. We find in Hebrews chapter 9. Uh, verse or chapter 4 verse 9 you can see the difference in a holy convocation an annual sabbath that moves depending on the time of the phase of the moon and then you see what the seven day sabbath the history behind it okay so uh, fulfillment in scripture so we've gone through the New Testament. They left on the day, they being Israel, this small, fragile at this point, Hebrew nation, left on the 15th of Nicene, or the, fifth, uh, uh, the 15th um, of the first month of their sacred calendar. Um, so we, we've come all this way. We've touched on why the, what is a holy convocation, why it's important, what's the purpose of it, and then the difference between the seven-day Sabbath and the holy convocation. Okay, so now with fulfillment of Scripture. Therefore, let us keep the feast not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. 
and Paul wrote that in Acts uh, chapter, uh, and, and not in Acts, I'm sorry, but 1 Corinthians um, chapter 5, verse 8. In the time of Jesus Christ, the feast of the Passover was a great feast of eight days. One day for the Passover meal, Nicene the 14th, and seven days for the feast of unleavened bread, Nicene the 15th through the 21st. It was seven days. They were so, so connected, so connected, a great feast called the Passover feast or the feast of the Passover, where the lamb was eaten on the 14th day of Nicene. Leaven would have been removed from the houses. From the, the lamb was eaten with bitter herbs and unleavened bread, and I kind of covered this before. This is their Seder, and this is what they ate up until the time of 70 A.D., and then things begin to change. And I, I don't cover that part because it's not in the Scripture, but take note, it does change when the temple is destroyed in 70 A.D. by the uh, Roman armies. Okay, so and there's no this is no coincidence that the first Passover mentioned in the New Testament involves Jesus Christ at the age of 12. Okay, and that's in Luke chapter 2. Around verse uh, between verse 40 and 45, somewhere in there. In a few short years, Jesus Christ went to his last supper, Passover supper at Jerusalem, and was crucified, shedding his blood. Think about that, shedding his blood for all who would become who would become our Passover lamb. And when he had given thanks. And he breaked it, break it, unleavened bread, and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This is in remembrance of me. And I think I said last week, there's no feast. You, um, the spring feasts, you can't get, you go from the shadow to the actual fulfillment. You have to go through the Passover dinner, a Passover meal, a, a feast. You have to go through that. In any case. And so what I've done is taken those parts that apply to that feast. So if you see some missing scriptures, that's because I chose the ones harmonized. Uh, if you do that, you, it's a beautiful story. And you all know that. But I'm just, if you harmonize those, those verses, it's incredible. It says, unleavened bread was to have been a constant reminder that Israel left Egypt in haste their need for an ongoing relationship with God, that holy convocation. Unleavened bread became a metaphor much like the cross for Christians. Israel was God's firstborn. He, was, he said, I will transform you into a kingdom of priests. That's in Leviticus. Think about that. What does Peter say about us? We're a peculiar people. We're priests and we're kings. But he was wanting to do this with Israel. He said, and you will be a light unto the Gentiles. In his book on the Feast of Israel, Bruce Scott writes, in Jewish writing, leaven was representative of evil impulse of the heart. Evil import, uh, impulse of the heart. Jesus Christ spares no words in pointing out several examples of how impulses of the heart, a.k.a. sin, are exposed to the actions of those around him. For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall no, in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. He's talking directly to the disciples when he says that. He's talking directly to us when he said that. Matthew 5, for I say unto you, 
that accept your righteousness exceed the righteous. I already read that, but here's my point. Woe unto you experts in the law because what? Because you have taken away the key of knowledge. You yourselves have not entered and you have hindered those who were entering. In Matthew chapter 13, uh, 33, there's a real short parable. And it says, Another parable spake he unto them, The king or the kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven which a woman took and hid three measures of meal till the whole was leavened. When I read three measures of meal, it goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 9 when the three messengers stood at the doorway of, uh, in front of the tent of Abraham. And it says, Sarah quickly, quickly, with three measures of meal, she made unleavened cakes. And then you go to Judges. Uh, well, Lot, Lot, when he saw the two angels, the two messengers in, uh, coming through the gate at Sodom and Gomorrah, the first thing he did, what did he do? He made unleavened cakes for them. You could see the excited hurriedness of it. And then there was uh, Gideon, who he made unleavened cakes for the angel of God. I mean, if you look at unleavened bread, it just didn't start in Exodus, but it became a, 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 a one of those things that you noticed and still today about Israel and their feasts. Unleavened bread was sinful. Unleavened, or eating leaven was considered to be sinful. It's sin. That's what it represents. The impulse, evil impulses of the heart. Okay, so in, in Matthew chapter 16, 11, how is it that you do not understand? I spake not to you concerning bread, that ye should beware of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And the un, they, then understood they. You notice know, that's the very next verse. Then understood they how that he bid them not to not uh, bid them not beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine, not of the leaven. It's a metaphor. He's using that as representing evil, representing sin. It says, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And again, he charged them saying. Take heed, beware the leaven of King Herod. Now, what could it be about Herod except that he's a crooked politician, a crooked king? But there's one thing that Herod did. He beheaded John the Baptist. I wonder, and that's why I use that. And she came in, and I think it was Herodias, she came into the, the straightaway with haste unto the king and asked, saying, I will that thou give me by and by in a charger the head of John the Baptist. I wonder if Jesus had that in mind. And in Luke, we began to say unto his disciples, first of all, beware ye of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. And the Lord said unto them, now do ye Pharisees make clean the outside of the cup and the platter, but your inward parts, the impulses of the heart, the inward parts is full of raving and wickedness. And this is one he doesn't use leaven, but I picture this every time I read it and scriptures like this, and this was during the first Passover, the first Passover feast, he come up to Jerusalem and he said unto them that sold doves these things. Take these things hence and make not my father's house a house of merchandise. He was cleaning the leaven out of the temple. That's what that was all about. You see how you don't have to use the word leaven to point out what it is. 
As for these things which you behold, the days will come in which there shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And of course, he's talking about the destruction of the temple in 70 A.D. There's other times that the Feast of Unleavened is bread. Keep in mind, Feast of Unleavened Bread is, if you put, if you put feast in bread, it decays. You ever think about that? The bread goes bad. I know I've, I've opened up a loaf of bread full of yeast, full of leaven, and it's moldy. It decays. Unleavened bread is in a different category. Okay? So it's used here, and you notice Herod Agrippa, Agrippa, because, and because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. But why didn't he? These were the days of unleavened bread. In other words, these were the feasts they were about to start or was in process. And in Romans 11, for if the first fruit be holy, the whole lump is also holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. And you go all the way back to Numbers and what he, the, the scripture he's quoting there. But Paul, I think, does it best. He uses... Um, he uses leaven as a metaphor. He's had a lot of trouble in the church of Corinth. They didn't believe in Jesus Christ. They didn't believe in the resurrection. They were talking about it. There was incest. There was, in, I'll call it immorality. But what does he say? Your glorying is not good. Know ye that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. And I know when I was young, I'd make pizza dough. And you had to put Chef Boradie, I think it was. Uh, the bo comes in a little box, right? And so you had to put yeast in it. And I'd put it on the register on the floor. And that yeast would just make that rise. And it would make the best pizza. It would permeate the entire dough ball, if you will, and rise. All right, it's, when he's talking about that, I read that. I think of that time when I was a kid. Many times, actually, I think of that. It said, Purge out the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For in Christ our Passover, for even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Jesus Christ is the only one that can remove the leaven from our lives. He's the only one that can remove the evil impulses of our heart. And ye did run well. And this is in Galatians chapter 5. It says, ye did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? This persuasion come not of him that calleth you a little leaven, leaven a whole lump. They were wanting to turn back to their old ways. There's a lot around this verse. A lot around. But with the leaven, with the unleavened bread of truth and uh, sincerity and truth. I just split that verse up, hopefully to make sense. Malice and wickedness. Okay, God fed Israel manna. Unleavened bread from heaven, which was the spiritual food of the Exodus generation. Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Jesus Christ is our unleavened bread. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, 
and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. And remember, I couldn't put it all on here. There were people, certain people heard that. They're going to eat his flesh. They're going to drink his blood. They were so skeptical because they missed the point. He is our unleavened bread. He was their unleavened bread. The night before Jesus fed 5,000 men, women, children with food of their flesh. Now he offers to provide himself to the world. Jesus is the word of God made flesh to die and deliver a message to the world. God loves you. The resurrected body of Jesus was translated into quickening spirit, giving life wherever it dwells. We can eat of Jesus by learning, by believing. By living by the words of Jesus, which are a part of him. Now let's go to the scripture. He was oppressed and was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He brought us as a lamb to the slaughter, and as sheep before her shears is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. And if you want to know in the Old Testament, Chapter 53 is replete with Jesus Christ. If you want to know who Jesus Christ is in the Old Testament, read Isaiah chapter 53. And so we find, and that we've seen some of this, so I won't go over it as I did in detail, but remember the Feast of Unleavened Bread to understand how it, it transforms from a shadow to reality. You must pass through the, the, the Passover meal or the Last Supper as we call it. Without that, we have no cause to call Jesus our Savior. On the 14th day of the new moon, remember the 14th day is always a new moon. First month of the sacred calendar, Jesus and his 12 disciples sat down to eat the Passover meal. And here we have somebody ask me last week, was Judas present? And I'm going to step out here because he wasn't present. He had left. They had gone through the feet washing. And what did Jesus say? Do this to you, ye do this to one another. And he also says, what? All you but one have been cleaned. Right? And I'm paraphrasing. I shouldn't do that. But I'm just trying to make the point here. So then Jesus, who betrayed him, answered and said, Master, they're at the dinner. They're at the dinner. He sat down. Notice the second set of verses. Now even was come and he sat down with the twelve. And they've gone through uh, several, you know, they've gone through the feet washing. They've gone through several con uh, conversations. And now they're setting back down. Okay, and said, then Judas which betrayed him, answered and said, Master, is it I? Only Judas is probably, only Judas, who is probably sitting at the left hand of Jesus, hears his answer and came to know that Jesus knew him. Judas was the treasure, or knew he. Judas was the treasure. Then Judas which betrayed him, and it's only written, notice that's only written in Matthew. There's, those verses do not harmonize. There's no verses to harmonize with uh, Matthew 26. There's no verses to harmonize with John chapter 13, 27. That's why it's important, though, that you read all four Gospels when you're reading anything in the Gospel to get the whole picture. Here we just have John. And it said, Then Judas, which betrayed him, answered and said, Master, is it I? And he said unto him, Thou hast said. By accepting sop, remember Judas did that. 
by accepting SOP, Judas is saying, I am your friend. Judas is like Satan, a liar and a murderer. And we get that right out of John chapter 8, verse 44. You, my own familiar friend in whom I trusted, did eat of my bread, hath lifted up his heel against me. That comes right out of Psalms, talking about Judas. And then we have the other parts. They did eat this body. They did eat all of it. Take, eat, this is my body. And then in Luke, it's so powerful. And they took, they took, and he he took bread, gave thanks, break it, and gave unto them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Likewise, also, the cup after supper. Remember, there's two cups, two visible cups. One before he gives thanks. This one is during what we call the Lord's Supper. This is my see where what um, this is my body which ye is given for me, which is given for me. This do in remembrance of me. Likewise, also the cup after supper, saying, "This cup is the new testament in my blood, which is shed for you." And then John, actually, John doesn't say anything. But Paul, Paul fills in for John, so accurately so. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. And this is a continuation, but this is what I want everybody to remember. The new, the new wine. The new wine will always be fresh because it springs forth from Jesus, from Jesus Christ. The well of living water. The New Testament will never grow old because it is the last will of the Lord Jesus Christ who died to set into operation. He is alive forevermore. And then we went over these. He was crucified. Hmm. He was crucified. And they gave me also gall for my meat. And in my thirst, they gave me vinegar to drink. And then we have two, two men from the Sanhedrin. I just think it's amazing. Who was the first to touch Jesus' dead body and take him off the cross? It was somebody from the Sanhedrin. Some of the most despised people that hated Jesus and Jesus would put them in their place every time they opened their mouth. And when the even was come, there come a rich man of Arimathea named Joseph, who also himself was Jesus' disciples. He went to Pilate, begged the body of Jesus Then Pilate commanded the body to be delivered. And we move on here. It's all four, you notice all four Gospels cover this aspect of what happened after the cross. That's so powerful that he's using a, 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 he's a disciple of Jesus Christ, but he's also a member of the Sanhedrin. Now, we don't know what happened, you know, after that, just like with Nicodemus, who went to him by night, went to him, Jesus Christ, by night. We don't know what happened in between. 
He's mentioned one other time in John, but he and Joseph Arimathea wrapped the body of Christ. It says, For David, after he had served God's purpose in his own generation, fell asleep and was buried among his fathers and underwent decay. But he whom God raised did not undergo decay. He's our unleavened bread. Bread with leaven decays. It's very important that we get that. Okay, so after Jesus' death on the cross, Joseph Arimathea, at a significant risk, went to the Roman governor Pilate to request Jesus' body and was granted permission to remove his body from the cross. Since this was the preparation day for the Sabbath, the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, Nicene the 15th, they removed Jesus' body off the cross and buried him in the grave of Joseph of Arimathea. Nicodemus, also a member of the Sanhedrin, accompanied Joseph, and they immediately began to prepare the body for burial. Following Jesus' custom, or the Jewish custom, they wrapped the body in strips of linen mixed in myrrh and aloe. However, it was a day of preparation. The next day of uh, Nicene the 15th, and you'll remember, they returned with a hundred pound weight to finish the burial. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death because he had no violence neither was any deceit in his mouth again Isaiah chapter 53 and that's our feast of unleavened bread does anybody have any questions no questions it's right at 730 um, if if um, we break for now. Um, would you be willing to stay over uh, 10, maybe 15 minutes next week so we could finish the Feast of First Fruits and the Feast of Weeks or the Feast of Harvest? We know, us, know it in the Greek as Pentecost. Okay, so I'll cover those two next week. I would really love to get all seven of them, but there is so much to cover. And believe me, I have reduced the number of slides. We could go on forever. <laughs> it is, it's, I don't know what to say. It's amazing. I would like to comment. Um, when a friend and I were teaching in Maryland, uh, there is a very strong, vibrant um, Jewish This whole street is full of Jews. The next street, the next street, until it the whole. became a community and got a name. And all the restaurants uh, were Jewish. And uh, her daughter opened a bakery. And so she prepared many unleavened things. Uh, uh, probably her biggest wedding cakes and um, but anyway when the um, the holy days would come 
So you all have countertops in uh, your kitchens. Well, they had them made so that they fit snugly, sort of snapped into place, and they covered all of their counters. And then during that seven days, anything that was against uh, their holy days never touched those counters. Wow. And uh, they would, they didn't have to take the, the other counters off. Understand. These fit snugly. But some things, all the pots and pans, everything had to go in this closet. And when they were done, they taped it um, and sealed it. So, um, I mean, they were devout. And, you know, they're in their 20s and 30s. Um, and this would have been in 1990, 2000, 2010. Um, and, and they're getting stronger uh -huh. um, as, as a community. Wow. They do, they do not get in their cars. That they can't. So, Amazing. And I, and I lived in Montgomery on a street of about 25 houses. And uh, we had, um, I had a Jewish neighbor next door to me for 28 years. We had three or four Jewish families. We had an Islamic family. I had a Hindu Buddhist family. I had Lutherans, Catholics, and Protestants all on that street. <laughs> children were raised. How about that? They were. They, my youngest was uh, was five when we moved <laughs> there. So, yeah. Wow. How about that? Anybody else? That's interesting. I have a, I have a Jewish friend and uh, he, he's uh, a Messianic Jew and he goes to church in the synagogue and uh, he, he is just an incredible guy when it comes. He creates this matzah, and uh, there's these balls of things that they make. I don't know what the name of it is, but he had to make 250 of them, you know, because of the gathering in his neighborhood. Um, it's, uh, wow. Just to be, be around that or be a part of it is just, Is that right? Mm -hmm. Wow. Wow. One and other comment. Okay. We had a new um, range from Sears. This was in Maryland. And Fran was fiddling around with uh, knobs and things on the dashboard and uh, getting it ready to turn on and bake when we were going to be at church. Mm-hmm. was actually an S. It was a Sabbath mode. Uh, so you could not use this <laughs> stove on the Sabbath. It shut down. They made sure you were going to celebrate. <laughs> That's interesting. Very much so. That's cool. Anybody, anybody else? I appreciate you guys so much for sharing. Really, it adds to the class really does. And I hope those who are listening, live streaming, has heard all that. I couldn't begin to repeat it. But uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Jerry, would you like to dismiss us?
Amen. Thank you, Jerry. And thank each one of you for coming. Hope to see you next week. Bring a friend. <laughs>